In this section, we're going to think about how sensory information is encoded in the nervous system uh, and also how sensory neurons supply parts of the body, for example, skin, um, and specifically looking at the idea of a receptive field. Now, let's start off by focusing in on the particular neurons that we're going to be studying. So here I'm going to just draw um, a cross-section through the spinal cord just to illustrate to you the specific neurons that I'm interested in today. So here we've just drawn the grey matter of the cord with the central canal and now I'm going to draw the dorsal root with the dorsal root ganglion there and the ventral root coming together to form the spinal nerve. So this is the spinal nerve and you should recall that the spinal nerve, nerve is a mixed motor and sensory structure whereas this dorsal root um, is purely sensory and this ventral root is purely motor. Now the neurons that we're going to be considering in this section are primary or first order sensory neurons. These are neurons which communicate with receptors within the skin or elsewhere on the body surface. So these primary sensory neurons communicate with receptors and it is the receptors, remember, which determines the given modality that that neuron deals with. Information comes in from the receptor along the axon of this first order sensory neuron and its cell body is found within the dorsal root ganglion here. The first order sensory neuron then projects into the spinal cord um, into a variety of places um, within the cord that we'll talk about in later sections. But what we are interested in as far as this is concerned is how information is um, encoded in this axon and how that information gets into the central nervous system. Now we can depict this neuron diagrammatically so just beneath here we'll draw the cell body of the neuron. Remember this is a pseudo unipolar neuron so it has only one process emanating from the cell body. We have our receptor out here which as we said communicates with the axon of the sensory neuron and then the axon projects into the central nervous system. Now, if we stimulate the receptor strongly, so if we give um, a strong stimulus to the receptor, so let's say that this is a thermoreceptor and we apply heat, we get a train of action potentials running along this axon. So I'm just showing here a train of action potentials moving along the axon there. So really what we've got running along um, the, the, the x-axis, if you like, is a time dimension. So strong stimulus of the receptor gives high frequency action potentials running along the axon, whereas weak stimulus of the receptor uh, leads to lower frequency trains of action potentials running along the axon. Now this is quite interesting to think about in a bit more detail because what we've got going on here is effectively um, an analogue to digital conversion. The receptor is dealing in the currency of um, electrical charge effectively, the movement of ions across the membrane of the receptor or of the sensory neuron, whereas action potentials are either on or off. So what we are doing is we're converting the intensity of an analogue stimulus into a frequency of discrete action potentials. So to a certain extent this is analogue to digital conversion. Now in terms of the physiology of primary sensory neurons, we have two broad flavours of primary sensory neurons. The first um, flavour of primary sensory neuron that we need to be aware of is known as the rapidly adapting type. All right. 
And that is exactly what it says on the tin. These neurons, when you stimulate them, they start off with a high frequency of action potentials, which eventually tails off, slowing down with time. Now, what kind of examples do we have of these rapidly adapting receptors in everyday life? Well, for example, the mechanoreceptors um, in our skin, many of these are rapidly adapting receptors. Think about it, when you put your clothes on, for example, initially you are conscious of those clothes touching your skin, but very, very rapidly um, you're no longer aware of it. And that corresponds with this initial high frequency activity, followed by the slowing of the activity um, with time. Another one might be the mechanoreceptors in your bottom, um, which initially you're aware of the pressure from the chair if you're sat down, but eventually you're not aware of it at all. The second group um, of sensory neurons are the slowly adapting ones. Now, in this case, a stimulus uh, might be applied, but the frequency of the action potentials doesn't really tend to decay. Okay? Now, why might this be helpful? Well, we see this, for example, um, in pain transmission. All right? So if you think about how pain is transmitted, if you've got a toothache, for example, that pain doesn't tend to go away. It's constantly there, annoying you for hours and hours on end, keeping you awake at night. And this kind of makes sense because nociceptors, i.e. pain receptors, nociceptors, these are slowly adapting and we wouldn't want them to be rapidly adapting because we wouldn't want to get used to the pain. If there's pain, it tells us that there's tissue damage and we need to do something about it. So nociceptive neurons are slowly adapting, meaning that they're constantly nagging at us to do something about this pain. Having talked about the um, temporal properties of sensory neurons, it's now worthwhile us taking a little look at their spatial properties. The important consideration when thinking about the spatial properties of sensi sensory neurons is the concept of the receptive field. And what the receptive field is, is essentially the area of skin that a sensory neuron collects information from. So let's um, draw on a sensory neuron here. So here's its cell body, here is its projection to the central nervous system and it is receiving information from an area of skin, um, whoops I've just realised I've drawn this wrong uh, but that doesn't matter at this point, I should have drawn this as a pseudo unipolar cell but it's going to turn out as a bipolar cell but let's not worry about that. So here we have um, the peripheral process going out to the skin, collecting information from uh, one, two, three areas of skin. And these three areas have receptors. These are all the same type of receptor um, because each individual sensory neuron only has one type of receptor. It wouldn't make sense for one sensory neuron to have both uh, thermoreceptors and vibration receptors, for example, because the nervous system would then get confused. So each neuron, each sensory neuron has one type of receptor. This region of skin here, which I've bracketed, is the receptive field of that neuron. Now let's draw a second sensory neuron, and I'll draw this one correctly on this occasion. So here is the pseudo-unipolar neuron with a single process emanating from the cell body. Here is its central process going towards the central nervous system and here is its peripheral process. And we'll put on once again three branches collecting information from three regions of skin. So there's one receptor there and there's another one here. And there's another one here. So here is the receptive field 
of our second neuron. What we note is that the receptive field of our second neuron is larger than the receptive field of our first neuron. And we would say that the first neuron with the smaller receptive field has a greater level of sensory acuity. So the acuity of a sensory system is proportional to uh, the reciprocal of the size the size of the receptive field. Now, an everyday example of this might be the sensor in your digital camera or your phone. If you have a very high megapixel rating, uh, then the receptive fields are very small. The pixels are small. So it's got a high acuity. It can resolve two points much, much better than a camera with a lower megapixel rating, which has much larger receptive fields. Now, there's a second um, thing to point out here. Notice that in this region here, the receptive field of the two neurons overlaps. So, for example, um, this top neuron could be a neuron subserving maybe the C5 dermatome, and the bottom neuron could be a neuron working for the C6 dermatome. And the implication of this overlapping of the receptive fields is actually very important clinically. Because there is this overlap, this implies that um, dermatomal boundaries can be fuzzy. And we know that that is the case. We know that if we are assessing dermatomes clinically, we wouldn't touch the patient right at the periphery of a dermatome. We would try to go for that autonomous region as close to the center of the dermatome as possible. The rationale for that being that if you go for the center of the dermatome, it is less likely that you're going to have ambiguity related to overlapping uh, receptive fields. Okay, thanks for listening.